Welcome to Inside the Paint, a roundtable discussion where our sports reporters dive deep into the Ironman boys and girls basketball seasons. I'm BJ, and as we head into the heart of the season, breaking all things down with me today are Bella, Ben, and Zach. We're your courtside pass to all things Ironman basketball. Zach, why don't you give us a quick recap of the boys' season? Well, the boys are headed to state for just the third time in history, third time under Coach Witzig. In 2010-2011, they ended state fourth place, and then their best run was in 2015, in which they ended second place. But at the start of the season, Coach Witzig actually said this team was more talented than that 2015 team. We got a record of 31-5 and and just came off of a dominating 53-29 to win over Downers Grove North. And, man, that was a crazy game. Yeah, it was electric in there, man. It was a really a hometown game for community. You know, ISU, the fans really showed out, and I think it really got to Downers Grove North. That was pretty electric. And, you know, as a team that Downers Grove, you know, they beat us earlier in the season. We kind of just destroyed them, came in and, you know, kind of owned them the whole game from the first quarter to the fourth quarter. So that was just a really great showing from the Ironman. I think it also kind of shows how important it is to have fans there because you have that game against Quincy. Quincy's a team that was about – at the same skill level of Downers Grove North, they were, like, right next to each other on the AP poll, and then that's a one-point game because I think you got the fans there, and there was, like, three-fourths Quincy at that game. Like, there was a lot of blue. And then this game was probably three-fourths us. Like, Downers Grove had their student section. That was about it. It was definitely more than three-fourths. It was probably, like, a good, like, yeah. six-sevenths. It was a lot. It was really loud in there. The fans really showed out. And I think they will again at the State Farm Center – in Champaign, Illinois, for the Friday 2 o'clock game against Palatine, but I'm sure they will show up as well. Yeah, yeah. I think as long as they give us a half day or in school mm-hmm. early, there's going to be a whole lot of iron there. I don't think I'm showing up to school. That's real. You can, man. You <laughs> can show up. Skip in school. Bella, how about a quick recap of the girls? Yeah, so their season ended uh, 31-4. They lost in the sectional finals to Alton. Um, so, basically... What they've achieved this season, they've had, they got second in Big 12, they're inter- inner city champions, State Farm Holiday Classic champions, regional regional champions, they did that three straight years. Um, this was their third sectional final appearance, so they've just done so much. Olivia Corson got second team uh, for all state coaches, and then Allie even got a special mention um, for the all state coaches, so... Just like a great year for us, even though we didn't get over that hump of the sectional finals. And sectional finals is still like Sweet 16, so that's an accomplishment in itself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about the Alton game. Yeah, that was a very, I don't know, I'd say the start, the first quarter was very lopsided. Alton came out with so much more energy, kind of just like through us all. Like Allie was talking on a different like, thing, she was saying, like, oh, no, are we going to get, like, blown out? So, like, community kind of came out in the second quarter with a lot more energy, and it got into, like, one point at, I don't know, the third quarter. Mm-hmm. So it was just, like, we kept fighting the whole way through, but we just couldn't get past. Like, Alton has so much, like, hustle. They were getting those offensive rebounds, and we just could not keep up. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I think like the energy in there was really was really great during that game. And yeah, I think you said we got it in, got it within like one at one point, and they were just shooting. We were just shooting really good. It looked like we were gonna go on a bit of a run, but then Alton just kind of like you said, they got the offensive rebounds. They just kind of kept extending possessions, and eventually they just you know they're a really skilled team. They eventually just got the bucket. So it kind of seems like that we were trying our hardest, but it just ultimately didn't really work out. But it was definitely a great showing for the Ironmen and a great run for them. Yeah, so looking forward, what's the girls' playoff picture look like? Um, wait, what? What's the <laughs> what? What's the going on with girls' playoffs now? Like, where's Alton at? Oh, Alton lost in the sectional, uh, the super sectional mm-hmm. against Wabonzi Valley. Wabonzi Valley then lost to Nazareth, who went to the state finals, and then Nazareth lost in the state finals. So the champions were Loyola. Okay. Okay, it's always them Chicago teams that really yeah. just take over. Yeah, Loyola won football, boys football too. Yeah, but Nazareth is really good at like every sport too, so yeah. that's not surprising at all to me. Yeah, I know the 1A game yesterday before Community and Downers Grove North was a Chicago team, Chicago Hope, Chicago I think. Hope Academy. Yeah, Chicago Hope Academy versus Hayworth, and that started out 
That was a really close game until like three minutes left, and then Chicago Hope wins by like yeah, fifteen. I don't know what happened to Hayworth. They just fell apart in the fourth quarter. Like it was honestly that going into the game, going uh, to half, I honestly had Hayworth winning because they just looked like a better team out there. But then number twelve, the sophomore. Oh my gosh, he he's so over, fast. Just yeah. took over. Like he was stealing everything at half court. Easy layup every time. Yeah, they were the student section was chanting, "You can't guard him." I don't think a chance ever been more true, bro. They could not hold that man. <laughs> and bad. the crazy part, he's the same height as me, bro. He's like five seven, <laughs> five eight. He was getting buckets, bro. I think they he could, might be shorter. I think yeah, he might be short. He might be short too, yeah. They cannot contain him, bro. I got to talk to him for a little second, and he's definitely a short guy, but he was really killing them. And my question, he was shooting over them, like he was doing fadeaways. I don't know how yeah. he gets it over, like. They were putting like six two, six three guys on him, and it was just arced up and swish every yeah. time. Yeah, and his and his floaters, he shot at least Woo! like ten of them, and it, it was just seemed like money every time. Honestly, Chicago Hope Academy is just an all around impressive team. I think I don't know their names because you know we weren't really covering that game. But um, number five on Chicago Hope was just yeah. freaky athletic. He almost he almost off that backboard when twelve threw it up to him off the backboard he almost slammed that one home. He almost put number thirty one Hayward's big dude um, on a poster too off two steps. Yeah, I saw that. That was insane. Yeah, now that game was wild. I was sitting in the Chicago um, student section and they were very loud too for the amount of people that they had there. Yeah, there weren't yeah. many from ho- like it didn't seem like a lot, of and they didn't have like a theme either, right? Yeah. No, nah, they was just there. Yeah, they're just there to support their team. <laughs> and Hayworth, on the other hand, brought their whole city. <laughs> they yeah. brought their mascot. They did. <laughs> now, I'm not going to lie. The mascot disappeared at halftime, and I think that might have been what? the issue. Yeah. Actually? Actually, because the, the mascot was there the whole time, and then we moved to the other side of the court, and I was like, where's the mascot at? But it was hot in there, though, so like he probably had to step outside or something. Maybe a mascot <laughs> injury, bro. Those happen. <laughs> Those happen. I've seen it. That might have sold their whole playoff chances. Man. Yeah. So all, all relying on the mascot. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but if we're talking about a crowd that was pretty electric also, I think our crowd for the community Ooh. DGN game, that was probably the best the best student section, the best fans. You know, I've, I've been to a few ISU games. I don't think I've ever seen the upper bowl as packed as it was nah. during that community game. So it was really just – it was a great thing to see. They had to expand our student section actually because, like, there was, there was too many people. So they had to move – they had to, like, make a whole other row for us. So it was just crazy energy. And I think DGN ultimately kind of – Folded under that pressure a little bit, and that's why, how we saw they only had what eight points at halftime, so, or no, something it like that. Eight, yeah, they had eight. It was eight, 25, yeah. 25 to eight community leave it, lead at halftime, and actually they only gave up two points in the first quarter. I was about to say that. And yeah, Ben, like you said, that's what I was saying right after the game with the fans there, because I've been to a lot of ISU games. There has not been an ISU game that packed this year. Mm-hmm. So fans really showed out, and almost all of them, like you said earlier, BJ, was ISU fans. Mm-hmm. And they really showed out. Me and Bo- Mr. Bovenkirk were sitting courtside, and I just I couldn't hear anything he was saying. Like, it was so <laughs> yeah. loud. I could he not hear a single thing. He tried to say something to me when I was in the crowd, and I was like, I cannot hear you. And that was before <laughs> the game. That was yeah. before the game. That's crazy. Yeah, it was a lot, a lot of community fans there. And honestly, I think it just has to do because it was at ISU. And we know it's a high stakes game. All the city was going to show out. I think I was trying to leave, and I swear I saw like thirty people that I knew, not even like at school, just like adults that was just there. So mm-hmm. yeah, we definitely had a great mm-hmm. turnout, and that's part of the reason we won, probably. I think so for yeah. sure. And like even like at the girls' um, state finals, they have a competition for the best student section. So they might do that for the boys too. I want to see if we can. Maybe get some consideration in that. Yeah, we definitely can. If people show up, we could definitely win that. If Quincy made it, <laughs> I think they would have won. Their student section, like, yeah. it was loud. They they were chaining across the across the court with the parents. The parents and the crowd. parents were getting into. Yeah, they it. were they were going toe to toe with each other, and that was uh, it was a little intimidating. But eventually, it was community fans who were rushing the court, so that was a little Buzzer sweet. Beat and dunk. It was so yeah. it was so fun rushing the court. Oh bro. my goodness! They, I felt bad for like the athletic director, our principal. I know, yeah, I did feel bad. They're, too. they're kind of trying to hold us back, but. When there's that many people, there's only, only so much you can do, and it, we kind of just started going crazy. So. And that's why they play these games at ISU in Illinois, because you, you can't do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, was yeah. really, I was analyzing those gates, trying to figure out if we was going to So play. was I. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at them the whole game. Yeah, the, when uh, there was a few minutes left, the AD came, Mr. Kirfa, he came up to us, and like all of us in the front row, he's, and he just like calmly kind of said, he's like, we're not storming. <laughs> we're not doing. We're not doing any of that. And then by the end of it, there is like just people like all over the exits. There was no way. There was no way yeah. to get out. 
So those ushers were doing their job the whole night too, for sure. But let's talk about that Quincy game a little bit because I unfortunately couldn't be there. So talk to us about what happened at the Quincy game. Ooh, ben, you where do, start? Where do where do you even start, man? I would say probably one of the best basketball games I've ever watched in person. Maybe just maybe the best. Yeah, maybe just in general. Best because, high school game I've been to. Hundred percent. Yeah, because you know if you're looking at the scope of the whole game, community just came out swinging, kind of like the DGN game. They were clamping up Quincy on defense, and then on offense they were shooting some threes. They really built up a sizable lead. I think it was like. 17-9. to nine Yeah, we might have even had a double-digit lead. Yeah, at some point. It was really it was really good, the feeding off the energy. But then, you know, Quincy just went on this kind of crazy run. There wasn't a lot of scoring, but it just it, we were just seemed so uncomfortable out there. I think and they went, they got it back to like 25-17 or something, some around there at halftime, and they went on like an 8-0 run to finish halftime. And then we went into the locker room that came out, and we still didn't score for like five minutes. So we, I don't, we probably didn't score for about – seven or eight minutes in the middle of that game. So it kind of felt like Quincy was just clawing back the whole game, and we were just were not playing good at all. But then at the same time, we were still in the game. So then we were able to overcome that a little bit, going a little bit of a run in the fourth quarter. But at the same time, it was back and it forth. Was, it was back and forth the whole fourth quarter. I think we had a five-point lead, but then Quincy kind of just comes down the court. Some dude pulls up from basically half, like almost half court, just bang, corner yeah. three. Bounces like five times, bang, and then it, oh my! And then finally, you know, we inbound the ball. Maybe a little bit of a controversial call. Maybe if maybe that a, was not a. There yeah. was they were letting them play the whole game. Yeah. So I think the people that were in the comment section like saying that was a foul. They were letting them play the whole game. Like you can't you can't say that when you're not actually at the game, seeing how it's going. Like they were letting everybody play. And you talked about at the end of the game how it was going back and forth, back and forth. I actually wrote a little article about it and. So Longcore knocked down a three with 44 seconds left, and that put Quincy up by one. Then, um, then we scored after that. Then Noah Cleveland goes to the free throw line. Community's got a two point lead with 21 seconds. Then that Don play that one that bounced. Yeah, the coach said it bounced about eight times before it went in, and they took that one point lead. And then with 4.3 seconds left, Quincy inbounds it, gets kind of tipped away to Roman, goes to Jaheim for the buzzer beating dunk. Oh when the game gosh. is that close, can you really call that foul? You can't. Yeah. Well, the, here's the thing: if Quincy, w- if it was the other way around, and Quincy would have scored that, like they would not be complaining about the call. Like it's, it's obviously it's tough that it didn't go there. If it didn't go their way, but like I, th- I feel like that's a call that's like it's unfortunate, but I don't think you can call that a foul, especially with the game on the line. Like I don't know. I feel like he was kind of already stumbling too when he got the ball. So maybe there was a there was a slight like push there, but eventually you know the game went how the game went, and community came out winners. So so what was the energy like in the crowd when we were down, but while Quincy was inbounding, and then what was the energy like after? Uh, it was we were kind of quiet. Like first Quincy, well you really gotta look at the Quincy student section because they were just so loud. Like they thought they had it won. Lots of lots of them trying to talk to our student section. There were. Not oh, to get yeah. into it, but there was a there was a lot of beef I on was both talking sides. To Parker Williams, and he was like, they were trying to pull up. And that's what he said. <laughs> uh, so yeah, to not get into too many specific, there was some crazy stuff going on, and Quincy really thought they had it, I think. And we started chanting back a little bit, but it was we were pretty quiet. And all of a sudden, it steals, and you can kind of just feel everybody just like take a deep breath in, and then Jaheem throws it down, and we just all storm down there and just start running. Was it in in any way similar to the Bradley Bourbonnet game? Uh, I think yeah. that's probably the best comparison that you can have. Like, even though at that point we were w- in the Bradley Bourbonnet, we were winning, and then they kind of did that. But then, yeah, like you said, we were kind of like everyone was kind of like, just like, oh shoot, we just lost. It's like you can't really do anything because you're kind of just watching. You got to hope for a miracle, yeah. and then a miracle happened. Like, I don't even know if I saw him like dunk it all the way because like I saw him start to go up with it, and then we all just started going crazy. Like, it's kind of like. You, you, like, black out for a second, and everyone's just – it's just, like, it was, like, crazy. I was, like – when I got home, I just started watching, like, a ton of angles, like, on the video. It's just – every time, it's just, like, oh, my goodness. So many people had videos. It was amazing. Yeah, it's, like, what have we just watched? And then I think that really cl- that really close win is kind of what had – community had this, like, extra edge going into that Downers Grove yeah. game because, you know, moving on to that one, you know, they, they lost by five to them earlier in the season. Granted, you know, they played – community had played, like, five games, and – a span of two days, but at the same time, you know, Downers Grove probably was thinking they can come in and win, but then, you know, community had was really 
had their season on the brink of, you know, being eliminated, and then they kind of just came in with that intensity that Downers Grove really just couldn't match, and we saw that win. It was just straight domination. Yeah, not to mention Downers Grove is who knocked us out in football, so I know that win felt, like, even better. And actually, relating it to football, so I think, uh, Ben, was their starting wide receiver Owen Thulin? Downers Grove. Is that number five? Yeah. Yeah, he was their starting so wide receiver. So he was their starting wide receiver, and he ended up fouling out in the third quarter. He was he yeah. was getting tested. He got teed up, too. He gave Braylon four shots he, in a he row. He got two fouls on one play because he fouled Braylon, mm-hmm. and then he got teed up. Then we That was really that was the big turning point because, I mean, we already had a really big lead, but that was kind of when we sealed the deal because Braylon has those four free throws, and we got the ball back. Yeah. And I think that's – but the Downers Grove North fans did not stop. After uh, that, no, they, they definitely didn't stop. They was going to the end of the game. They said some, they said some crazy chants. Definitely had some crazy chants. We should have got, we should have had some going after too. haircuts and stuff. That's Everything. that was a little bogus. That was bogus. But he made them both, and then he had yep. two dunks after. Jaheim had two dunks in the fourth quarter after they started. They started talking. Yeah, yeah I think I think the Ironman really just played like pretty much as perfect of a game as we've seen them play all season. Because you know, defense. The defense. I think we just like physically overpowered them. Got in their heads. You know. Two for 35 from three kind of speaks for itself. That's just – I think the fo- the four of us could probably go there and shoot a little better than that <laughs> in the game, if I'm being honest. Nice. But, yeah, that's – we just – they could not get anything going. I know. Like, we kind of just – they couldn't match our energy. We had, a, like, a few blocks. I think we had five in total. And, you know, there's just – not. they had to start fouling in the third quarter. They just, like, could not get comfortable around there at all. We just, like – didn't give them anything. It was really great to see, and I think that was just probably the best game that we've seen from the Ironman this year. And yeah. their best three-point shooter, well, just their best player, the Princeton commit, Jack Stanton, he was the best three-point shooter on the night. He went two for 13 from three. Insane. Oh, my goodness. And he was, like, we watched his highlight reel yesterday, and he was doing some of the same things that he was doing there, but it was off. It didn't It didn't work against us because I think our perimeter defense has gotten so much better since the beginning of the season, and playing such a tough schedule and taking five losses – I think that really helped us. Like, we learned a lot from every loss. You could yeah. see how the change in defense as the seasons progressed. Like, we've been giving up an average of 38 points a game in the playoffs. Yeah. And that's insane. I think we're the turning point, if you're really going to the scope of the season, because, that, de- like you said, the defense has definitely gotten so much better. I think the turning point for us uh, defensively was the Metamora game. I was going to say the same thing. I point. would say, because in that Metamora game, you really could not give Metamora an inch of space at all to kind of shoot or anything because they had so many threats on the court. So they had to, like, all the – even the big men, all of them, they had to really, like, stay on their guys so closely and just play physical ball. But then we saw in that second half they kind of came out a little tired, it seems like, after that from just, you know, following them around the whole game. And they eventually fell to Metamora. But then in this game it it was just perfect all the way through. We matched the intensity. We were just on our guys the whole time. We were hustling for rebounds. I thought that was a great, like, defensive rebounding effort. We just did not let them get any second chance points, and we just got the ball down the court, and you know, we prevailed. So that was it was just really great to see, and it really makes me hopeful for these Friday and Saturday games. Hopefully, yeah. And speaking of Metamora, just taking a look at the three A and four A brackets so far, Thornton had a big upset as yeah. they beat Metamora. Everybody mm. was shocked by that one. Took them down sixty one fifty five, and then last night. Rich Woods took on Thornton. That's the number three player in Illinois versus the number one player. Both centers. That was a big matchup, and Rich Woods ended up winning 58-52. Lathan Somerville had 32 points, and now we have two Big 12 teams that are in the Final Four going to state in 3A and 4A. Love to see it. Yeah, Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, P&D did win the state championship for 3A? Yeah, for 3A. For 2A? 2A. Yeah, 2 2A. Yeah, so yeah. Big 12 representing, love to see it. Yeah, Wait, you, P&D won? Yeah, they mm-hmm. did. It was a buzzer. That a bu- was oh, a yeah, game, game winning, Game winning oh, shot. Right. for. It was like either. one second left. Yeah. yeah. It was an Emmy world. Is that her name? Yeah, Emmy. She's yeah. just a freshman. Yeah, that that's wow. That's a crazy oh, yeah. shot. Yeah. That reminds me of uh, biggest stage. Michigan Jordan Poole. Remember when he was a freshman <laughs> and he knocked down that buzzer beater? <laughs> yeah. Well, before we go, do y'all three have any final things to say about um, the f- the rest of the season going forward and the girls' season? Uh, for for the boys, I know defense is key. You want to talk about the upcoming girls' season before we go into the boys a little more? Just like next season, what's it looking like? Who's yeah. who's leaving? Things are going to look have? very different. 
Um, I'm pretty sure our starting lineup, like four out of five are seniors. Biggest, like, absent, Olivia Corson. I mean, she's been our star player for, like, three years. <laughs> so having that absence will be, I mean, definitely felt. Um, Alliance, that will be Gianna, like, Allie Rustemeyer. So many of these players that have just had so much play time in the last three years are just going to be gone. Yeah. And, like, even that, like, Sophie Barlow, that, like, presence in yeah. the locker room, just I think it's going to be a lot of rebuilding, not as much um, veteran leadership that we've had all of the years. So I don't think that will be as much of our strength, but – I'm excited to see, like, new players emerging. Yeah. What yeah. I'm excited for is Amia to step up and take a leadership role as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I remember seeing – so there's actually seven seniors from the girls, seven seniors from the boys. All of them get a lot of playing time. So it's definitely going to be a big change coming in next season. But the boys are in the state semifinals against Palatine on Friday at Champaign at 2 p.m. And I am Zachary Knox Doyle. I'm here with BJ, Bella, and Ben. Thank you for joining us. I'm